Hey everybody, it's Kerry Oberbrunner. Great to be with you today on this Monday, July 2nd morning. I am so honored to be with Dean Folks. Welcome, Dean. How are you doing today? Doing good. How are you doing on this Monday? I'm doing fantastic. Look, we got some great people already popping in. We got Alice from Tennessee. I like Tennessee. You like Tennessee, Dean? All in for the volunteers. We have volunteers in our family. So All right. Very good. Karen's coming in from Maine. So we got a bunch of different people. Listen, guys, go ahead, type in where you're from. Dean, we're going to be talking about a very important topic today. I mean, you look at social media today and everybody seems to have this cause of the day that, you know, we should be concerned about. And I think it's so easy to be like an armchair social activist, you know, where we don't do anything except, you know, fire off on social media what we think, what people should do. And yet you've done this unique thing where you've basically created an organization. It's called LifePoint. But instead of talking about life change, you actually get in the game. First of all, talk to us a little bit about why you think today especially we need to get in the game, off our chair, and be active um, in this day of social media. What do you think? Yeah, I think that the first thing is that you'll never have passion until you are boots on the ground. Interesting. And everything else is theory. Um, and, and theory and philosophy come very easily to us. So one of the guys on our team talks consistently about keyboard courage. It's easy to sit behind a monitor on a social media platform and type out what you think and give your opinion about what somebody else is doing. And he, he just always says, keyboard courage. I'm writing that down. Keep going. No problem. So one of the things that I've really been blessed by is to have the opportunities, even uh, when I was younger, when I was actually first in college, to actually go places and have my life linked up with people who said, we're actually going to go do this. We're not just going to talk about it. We're not going to live in philosophy and theory, um, but we're going we're gonna to strap the boots on. We're going to go. We're going to see it and feel it, smell it, um, know what it's like. And for me anyway, you know, most of my time spent <laughs> interacting, at least in an international context, has been in the third world. Wow. which brings a number of unusual dynamics, to be honest with you. Um, but I also think it's very important that we don't just think outside of our borders, but you know, inside as well. Yeah. So listen, folks, we had a num- number of people just join us. Welcome. We're talking all about how we can use our gifts, our talents, our skills, even our wealth to help solve some of the biggest problems out there. Listen, I'm going to put a little challenge out there for you guys today. This is not a pitch. We're not selling anything at the end. We will talk about an event coming up, but there's no hard sell. And so what I'm going to ask you to do right now is actually have real keyboard courage (laughs) and share this. Share this feed right now because, look, we're going to talk about how to actually get in the game of life and solve some of the world's biggest problems. Dean, I know that um, money is not evil. I mean, we both believe in a book that doesn't talk about money being evil. Um, The love of money can be evil. But how important is it to have resources? Because I'm guessing when you travel to third world countries, I'm guessing when you built some of those schools, dug some of those wells, like it cost money. So why do you think it's important to be a successful business person, but also turn around then and be involved in kingdom opportunities? Like, is that, is that an opposition or are those two integrated? Well, <clears throat> so the question sometimes comes down to Carrie is, is who's the king of the kingdom, right? Oh, what, good. what's going to be the ultimate end? And again, I'm, I don't, I've got some context, but I'll talk about the people on our team and one of the folks on our team, uh, her name is Christy, who helps us lead in these initiatives. She really points us towards indigenous ownership. What is that? So it's, a, it's important that whenever you um, begin an initiative to think with the end in mind. So in other words, am I going to go to another country? Am I going to go to uh, an urban context in the United States? Am I going to go there and serve with strings attached to me? Mm. Or am I going to try and empower 
local people, international people to develop ownership. Love and it. as they develop ownership, so in a sense, when you're talking about why is it important to have resources, at the end of the day, you don't want as much as possible, you want to empower local people to have ownership so that the resources you invest are there long term and not just short term. Too many times um, we try to go out and do things, I think, mm -hmm. both nationally and internationally and develop systems that are not sustainable over time there you go. because somehow the um, the social capital that we have developed and that we're investing in is really tied towards me feeling good about what I did as opposed to actually going and doing good and then handing that off to local people. Interesting. So listen, we got some great viewers. Mark Williams mm -hmm. is jumping on. He's already writing notes. Here's what I like for you guys to do. I like for you to weigh in and Tara agrees as well. Weigh in with the fact that, here's the question, do you think it's easier today in 2018 to be globally minded and socially concerned, or do you think it was easier 20 years ago? I'm going to ask you a question. What do you guys think? I'd love to see a little vote. I'd love to see people weigh in. Is it easier today in 2018 to be globally minded and socially conscious or was it easier 20 years ago? What do you think? And, and just why? Just type in some thoughts there. So, Dean, I know you're a busy man. I know you travel. Uh, you speak a lot of places. You are a fantastic speaker. We are talking about also the Igniting Souls Conference. It is October 26th through the 28th. I think, is this going to be your like fourth or fifth year? I don't even know. Yeah, this will be my fourth year. Your fourth yeah. year. But it's your fourth year coming back. You've met people, and literally, these people fly in from Australia, Nigeria last year, uh, Scotland, the UK. People come from all over to this place called Columbus, Ohio. It's often authors, coaches, speakers, entrepreneurs, business people. They come, talk about the energy in the room, first of all. Like, why do you keep coming back? Why do you give up your time to do that? Uh, talk a little bit for the person who's never been at that conference. What's a little feeling they can get by being there? Yeah, I think from I'll just talk from personal experience. So for me, it became a vision think tank for me. Hmm. I I came the first year and I expected to come and to give and to invest. What I did not expect is the investment that came back to me in return. Um, like you said, um, very, very blessed, man. I get to speak in a number of places. Yeah. And most of the time, whenever I go speak, I feel, uh, and, I, and I am, it's great. That's why I'm there. I'm the investor, right? Um, but when I came to Igniting Souls the first year, I felt like the investee, if I can say it that way. It's probably not a word, but we'll just make it up as I go, right? Um, and the reason I say that is, you know, I would have, I never had vision for writing. I never had vision for sharing um, what God was stirring up on the inside of me. And so really the help for me in being there and being part of the conference was really a vision think tank for me. It brought things out of me that I kind of had a hint were there, but I just didn't know how. Interesting. Yeah, I remember seeing you sit, sitting there one session last year, and I think it was Mike Kim or something, and I saw you taking notes, and you were kind of saying, I need to take some of this stuff back to – our team and our organization, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it's been super helpful. You know, one of the things I very much appreciate about Mike is that even though Mike shares outside of maybe my peculiar context, yeah. some of the things, a lot of the things that he said completely made sense in my context. And then especially just where Mike is concerned, man, I found him to be super helpful, super responsive, even outside of the conference about questions that I had. And I think everybody there is like that. I think people show up to help. Exactly. Listen, I'm going to ask you, grab your book, grab your book, hold it up right in front of your head. Because <laughs> There you go. Your next 30 days. Mm -hmm. I want to talk a little bit about that, Dean, because listen, there's a lot of people watching right now that uh, maybe they've had this stirring about, you know, I have a message. Maybe it's on stage. Maybe it's in a book form, podcast, blog, you name it. They have this message God's put deep inside their head and their heart but they don't know how to get it out. I remember when you and I booked a Starbucks meeting on 23 and Powell Road and you said, hey, I'm thinking about 
a book, but why should I? And then you said, like, should I write it myself? Right. Should I have a ghostwriter? I mean, we talked about all these deep questions not too long ago. I mean, it was probably, I don't know, a year and a half ago or something. Why did you, first of all, think that you were supposed to write a book? So I thought that I had a peculiar niche inside of my context, which is a faith context, um, that wasn't being spoken to. Okay. Um, but I, I just didn't think at that time, I didn't, I didn't think I could do it on yeah. my own. I didn't know how to do it. I didn't, Is he? I didn't know. Yeah, right. And would a publishing company pick up somebody like me in my context who's never written, who's never been published before, and then yet you feel the tension of, can I do it? I think the thing that I said to you that day was, listen, if I do this, I want to do it well. Yep. I want to do it where it, where I feel like, man, I'm really speaking to people. I want to be worth the investment of, investment of my time. Yeah. So um, I just didn't know how. Yeah. And the powerful thing for me, really, from you know AAE was for me was just the how. They've helped me with the how. And the man, the real blessing are just the stories of people who are reading it, who are yeah. saying, "Man, Dean, this is helping me." That's this awesome. Is, this has moved me from A to B. That's those are the and that's the reason. Really, that's the reason I wrote it. I, I wanted to help move people. Mm -hmm. Can you read your subtitle? Because I love subtitles. We spent some time on that. I think it. And, and again, for people who are just watching, I'm going to give some tips right now. You want with your book title the title to hook. So your next thirty days hooks people. And then what you want your subtitle to do is explain the benefits. People, especially with nonfiction, they say, okay, what am I going to get if I put down some money, but more importantly, time? What am I going to get out of this? So if you don't mind, read that subtitle. Sure. It's finding a life of hope, faith, and love in a world of apathy, doubt, and fear. I love it. So faith, hope, and love. love. And love. I think that's a good verse somewhere. Yeah, right. And then, and then, so you're finding that instead of, and then what was the instead of? Apathy, doubt, and fear. Oh, see, I mean, right there, Dean, again, sorry, I got to put on my coaching hat here for the <laughs> listeners. But right there, what Dean did is he entered the conversation that's going on in people's heads and hearts. I mean, everybody today, they won't admit it, but they woke up today with a little bit of apathy a little bit of fear, a little bit of doubt. And as a result, if that permeates, or if you tune, tune into CNN, constant negative news, that's going to foster and grow. And then you're going to just broadcast that. And you and I both know we have a creator who doesn't want his children to be doubtful, fearful, and apathetic. I mean, life's too short for that. So I love your book. I think it hit a bullseye with people. But why is it called Your Next 30 Days? I mean, that's interesting. It sounds to me, and maybe I'm letting a little secret out, it sounds to me like it could be a series. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So let's talk a little bit about what is your next 30 days? Like, is it for people that, you know, next 30 days of real estate? I mean, what is it about? Yeah, so we come at the book from a faith perspective. In other words, we want people to understand this uh, gospel foundation. We're all undeniably flawed and unbelievably loved. And we believe those two things are the are the things that change us. So we played off the idea of the 26-day habit. So we thought if for 30 days people would take time every day to invest in their spiritual lives, we felt like that's what's going to create momentum and movement in their life to see significant change. So what happens is apathy, doubt, and fear, those things freeze us. Mm. So for some folks, it's not like you can read for a day or for two days or for three days. So instead of just writing a book with information in it, we broke it down into bite-sized pieces once a day, every day for 30 days. We feel like if people will develop this rhythm, if you think about music, sure. it's a rhythm in your life of engaging and reflecting, engaging the world, doing what you do, and yet taking time on a regular basis to reflect on what you're doing and, and ask yourself the question, is this really what I'm designed, created to do? Am I making a real difference? I love it. I love it. Dean, that's powerful. And listen, you don't, you're not into numbers, but listen, I am your publisher 
And so I'm pretty excited for you. Our model is unique, by the way. Author Academy Elite's very unique model. We don't um, take royalties. We don't take your intellectual property. It's really a collaboration. But Dean, tell us just how many people have been able to be reached through this book. What do you think? I mean, your books, I I call them seeds. You know, books are seeds. They go out. But how many seeds have been planted so far? And you only published... I think November 30th. Correct. Yep, yeah, that's correct. Yeah, I'm, I, I don't have a hard number for you, Carrie, but um, I'm, I'm, I'm over 6,000 copies. 6,000 seeds have been, have been planted as much I as I know. It. Yep. So, folks, I, I just want you to grasp that. I mean, the average traditionally published book, we're talking about Harper Collins, Simon & Schuster, Doubleday, Random House, the average nonfiction book only has 250 sales a year, okay? Now, Dean has done over 6,000 in seven, eight months. And I just want to say that I think there's a number of reasons why. Number one, the book is not about Dean. I mean, you didn't brand you didn't brand it Dean's Next 30 Days. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I didn't brand your, your secret name. Carrie's secret name, right? So first of all, from a from a marketing standpoint, I want everyone to really realize, like, if you're an author, you're a servant, okay? And sure, there's, there's, there's those certain authors who are, it's all about them and all this stuff, and fine, maybe they're the unique whatever, upper crust. But the people I run with view their book as a tool to help people in their lives. So Dean, number one, I think you did that well. Number two, you have this bulk order concept that I think is really smart, which I think most authors don't even think about. Most authors only think about one copy, one copy, one copy. We just had a lady launch, Diane, uh, this weekend, and even I told her, like, hey, even though you're not part of a big organization, offer a five-volume bulk package. And she did that, Dean, and she said they flew off the shelf because people Mm -hmm. ordered five at a time. But how have you been able to tap into this whole thing with churches who also need their people to begin a 30-day journey? And have you seen kind of bulk orders that way? Because I know a lot of authors are curious. They're watching right now. Like, how do I do this? Is that part of your strategy as well? Yeah, so really um, the book in its in its initial form was designed to help new believers, people who weren't even believers yet, or people who were looking for a spark in their daily devotional uh, lives. So the context for the book was to share it with churches and help to really quite honestly, Carrie, if I'm, if I'm straight yeah. up, our church was not doing as good a job as we could of helping people who were beginning their faith journey. And I, and as I prayed about it, this is kind of the, the road the Lord brought me down and in the circumstances of bringing me together um, with the Igniting Souls Conference kind of work together. And that's how God spoke to me about the resource. So we're using it at our church. And so I thought, man, I want to make it available. If other churches are having the same issue, we are other churches are seeing the same things that we're seeing. And so the, the interesting thing about it is what I didn't realize is that other churches may want to use the book to help folks inside the context of their church in the rhythm of their own devotional lives. And so it's probably not the best way to say it, but it was an, an unintended consequence yeah. is that as other people heard about it. And so the bulk order, uh, the way that was super helpful to me is that when a church says, Hey, I, I don't want to pay full price, maybe on Amazon or in a bookstore or somewhere else, we mm-hmm. could easily help them. I love it. I love it. So listen, a couple thoughts here that I'm going to put out there for people because we didn't even really intend for this, but some people may be saying, I got a message in me. I got to write a book. I'm going to put a link there. We have something called a five-day challenge that we just started um, a few, a day ago. And we already have 10,000 people that have taken this challenge. So, I mean, it's crazy. I just put the link there. But a couple other thoughts. Notice, folks, I'm going to put on the coaching hat here. Okay, by the way, here's the link. I'm going to put on the coaching hat. Dean solved a problem for his own context. Did you guys catch that? When you become an author, it's not, hey, what's going to sell? 
hey, what's going to make me rich? Mm -hmm. Hey, what's going to make me famous? Dean said, what's the current pain that our context feels? And I'm going to go out and try to solve it and crack the code. And Dean, that's how I've written every single book. In other words, day job to dream job. I said, mm -hmm. I don't know how to weed my day job. So I, I, I said, I'm going to go figure it out. And then when I figured it out, people said, hey, can you write a book on that? Can you show me how? And then I showed them how. So I want authors to think right now, the area of your deepest pain is often going to be the area of your biggest impact. Let me say that again. The area of your deepest pain or problem is often going to be the area of your biggest impact. That's Dean, is that true? I mean, you said I was struggling when new people came to faith. Didn't have a plan. Yeah. And so if if you can connect those two dots, I love it. Most of the time, you're providing not only an answer for your context, but almost always for somebody else's context as well. I love it. And by the way, a lot of people have shared this. I just saw seven people. Thank you so much. If you guys can share this, that'd be awesome. Just type in the word shared as well when you do. And uh, I don't know, I'll ask Eric how to come back and give you a little bit of uh, you know, a download or something special, um, just for, you know, our goal is to ignite 1 million souls by 2020. We're probably going to hit that this fall. So we're excited. Dean, a uh, couple things as we wrap up today. All right. A couple things. So one is, um, you talked about, we need resources to be able to solve the world's problem. In other words, we do live in an economy. We live in a world that requires resources. Not everything is just free. And so I think, I don't wanna put words in your mouth, but I think you're saying that it's okay for business people and entrepreneurs to learn how to optimize what they're doing so that they can have more resources. Sure, some to spend in, on themselves. There's nothing wrong with enjoying life, but also, to solve some of the world's problems. Do you, is that kind of what you're saying is important? Yeah, I, I honestly, Carrie, I think we're designed for it. I watch people all of the time um, give away resources and live in generosity um, to the degree that would make most people uncomfortable yeah. and they're excited about it. <laughs> they're happy to do it. And the reason they're happy to do it is because they believe it makes a difference. And then they go and they see that it makes a difference. And there's something hardwired into where you're, whether you're a Christian believer or not a Christian, member, there, there's something hardwired into us to make a difference. I love it. So we're created to make a difference and resources do make a difference. I mean, when you listen, a um, personal story here. Okay. You know, Dean, that I had shoulder surgery back in January, okay? So here, this is funny. I'm on medicine. I'm all torn up, literally, and I'm sitting at my email inbox, okay, on a, on a Saturday morning after the surgery. And all of a sudden, I open my email, and it says, somebody's name that I can't even pronounce needs surgery. And, I'm, and I would have never opened that email otherwise. No. Oh my gosh, somebody needs surgery. <laughs> I just I just had surgery. And I open up this email and it's from um, Vision Trust. And Vision Trust shows this picture of this guy's leg that's like so jacked up. I mean, just totally jacked up. The knee's all bent and twisted. And the email says like, this guy is a national. He lives in that area. And he will not be able to continue to reach the kids unless his leg gets fixed. And there's me in my little suburban home here, you know, got my kombucha or whatever I'm drinking, you know, <laughs> air conditioning, but I'm having pain in my, and I'm like, I'm so glad I got my arm fixed and I had the resources. So what do you think I did, Dean? <laughs> you clicked. I know you clicked. You I, clicked. clicked. I, clicked. I, clicked. <laughs> I said, I have to give, and listen, I'm not saying that to toot my own horn. I'm saying, look, I couldn't have done that. Mm -hmm. Six, seven years ago, we didn't even have the margin financially to be able to do something. And so I love what you're saying about authors, coaches, speakers, entrepreneurs who are doing things intelligently and smart, not so that they can invest in themselves, but invest in the kingdom. 
Dean, I love it. We're super excited to have you come speak for the fourth year in a row. That means you're doing something smart, by the way. I don't, I don't know nice. if anybody's gotten an invitation that many times yeah. back. But but <laughs> uh, are you going to be writing another book? Let's talk about that. Maybe we can't share the title yet, but um, are you going to continue to keep growing your message uh, as well that God's given you? Yeah, so I'm in process right now. I'm just developing vision for another resource. And again, I'm kind of going about it the same way. I'm praying about it, thinking it through, and I'm asking, does this answer a question? Uh, I don't have any desire, to be honest at all, to write a book yeah. for my sake. But if I can put together a resource with a group of people that solves a problem, that then potentially solves other problems in the context of a faith, I would love to do it. I love it. I love it. So listen, guys, I'm going to challenge you right now. I know I have your book on my shelf, but it's amidst all of our other authors, and I can't just grab it quick. Otherwise, I'll sit there looking for it. So hold up your book one more time, Dean. Your next 30 days. It's on Amazon. It's on Barnes & Noble. You can get it anywhere in the world. And I want to challenge you guys right now. Look, if you are new to the faith or if you know somebody who you're sharing your faith with, you need to get that book. It's 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 actually funny. There, I mean, there's part there's stories in there that are funny. It's relevant. It's not heavy handed like you know you need a seminary degree to interpret it. It's just a good book that's going to draw you closer. I say to your creator, your core, and your community. So first of all, check out that book. Second of all, Dean, you know that we. Well, I'll put it this way. The only complaint people had it last year was not your talk, not my talk. It was, it's too tight. And so we literally left the quest, great people, got the Hilton Polaris. We have more seats, but they're going fast. And so we have what's called the early bird deadline, July 11th, and then tickets begin to increase. Right now, it's ridiculously low. So I want to encourage people, like, if something Dean shared today, or if you think you got to be part of this amazing conference, Jump in there. It's ignitingsoulsconference.com. We'd love to see you there. Just like Dean came to serve, he actually received a ton. And uh, Dean, I'm just excited that all you're doing and God's doing in your life. And listen, I'm proud to say I attend your church. I mean, I know it's not your yeah. church, but but I but I I love that church. And just yesterday, uh, by the way, Kelly and I have a joke about you. Can I share a little joke about you? Well, I think you're going to, whether I say yes or no, right? So. so listen, most authors at the end, you know, when they talk about their book, they're kind of like me focused. You know, they're like, hey, I wrote this book and blah, blah, blah. Dean is so humble that at the end of the church service, when he gives away his book free, by the way, he says, here's a little resource we, we wrote for you. And I turn to my wife every Sunday and I'm like, why well, doesn't he, you know, but we're joking. I still should say we. But I just, sure. and, and Kelly and I shake our head because, because uh, listen, I think it's a good thing. Um, but you do. You give the team credit. You're, you're that type of person. You're not all about yourself. And uh, I know that. I see it every week. People walk away holding that resource and I know that their lives are going to be changed long after your message ends. And that that's that's what I call, Dean, passive impacts. Mm -hmm. See, everybody cares about passive income where you go to sleep at night and money comes in your bank account. Very few people understand passive impact. And, and let's wrap up with this, Dean. Have you seen that result where people you've never met, people you've never been able to have a chat with, they write you and say, hey, your book impacted me or changed my life. Have you started to see some of that passive impact? Yeah, it's it's really been fun. It you know, just like you asked people to share this morning, people um, have bought the book and given it away, given it to relatives, and I've been blessed, man, to get feedback from folks that never have met and never will meet. I'll never, and they said, man, God's used this in my life in this way, in this way, in this way, and so yeah, that's been very blessed. Awesome. Listen, let's wrap up with this, folks. If you think, man, that was a long talk today about God. Listen, a lot of our <laughs> authors aren't faith people. We have books on health. We have books on 
romance, uh, as long as it's not crazy, crazy stuff. Um, I mean, we have books on every genre, children's books, coffee table books. And Dean, here's a little confession for you, man. Like when I, I used to be a pastor, right? And when I was uh, thinking about leaving about seven years ago, I had doubts. I had like, am I selling out? Mm -hmm. Am I giving up on God? And all I'm saying is like for the person that's watching today who says, you know what, can I be a businessman and have a faith or can I be a woman entrepreneur? What would you say, does God only exist in the four walls of the church or do you feel like the marketplace is the new mission field? I mean, what do you think? Well, I would actually say the marketplace is the old mission field. If you (laughs) read the New Testament, the people who have the majority of impact, the carriers are not, are not what we would consider paid clergy or pastors. They were, they were fishermen. They were, I mean, they had occupations, marketplace lives. Um, They just were very intentional about the market that they lived in, worked in and played in. I love it. I love it. So listen, folks, wherever you are, you know, realize that today you are a soul on fire. You can have impact. Dean, thanks so much. And Lisa says, I picked up Dean's book last year. The conference is a great book. He's an awesome speaker. Looking forward to Igniting Souls 2018. So listen, man, we're going to have a blast. Thanks so much for being here today. We're going to share this on the Daily Show YouTube. The podcast is going to get out. But Dean, thanks for all your impact that you're doing. All right. Thank you. Thanks for your time today, too. Appreciate it. See ya.